as you probably remember, after immediately after the revolution, uh, the Mojahideen, with more than an organization, became a social movement. So my interest was what was the social basis of this mass movement? And we forget now that it became actually a major threat to the Islamic Republic uh, very quickly after the revolution. So I was interested in exploring it. Like before I'd explored the social basis of the two-day party, I was interested in the social basis of the Mujahideen. And of course, to do that, you also have to look at who were the actual people? And here we were, I was lucky enough, there's enough material because uh, Mojahideen had a lot of publications. They often had biographies of their leaders, especially of their martyrs. So the information was there. It wasn't like you having to speculate. Well, you could get hard, hard data on the number of people who uh, were killed under the Shah, then during the revolution and after revolution, who they were, uh, their age, their uh, educational background, their family background. So from that, I was also interested to see what basically strata of societies that the Mojahideen came from. And here, of course, then this opened up a, a new realm that you could see in Iranian politics here. It was ideologically something new. It was uh, a merger of radical uh, secular thought, especially even on uh, some ways verging on Marxism, uh, together with um, a reinterpretation of Shiism into a very radical Shiism, something even more radical than uh, Shariati had developed. So the, the question then became, uh, what's, what's the social basis? What's the ideology of the Mujahideen? Um, and where do these uh, this uh, strata, I would say, uh, come from? And the more I looked at it, what I was clear enough is the Mujahideen was really a movement of younger people, uh, men as well as women, from uh, traditional middle class backgrounds. Uh, you could even call it Bazari backgrounds who had been exposed to modern education, especially uh, scientific education. So here you, uh, you saw in Iran actually development of a new strata within the old class structure. It, they are middle class, but because they come from the traditional middle class, but adopt radical ideas, they become almost the strata, separate strata from the traditional bazaar middle class. And that also explains the intense rivalry and conflict between the Mujahideen and the clerical uh, hierarchy. So you have basically an Islam that is highly revolutionary, but also is also uh, anti-clerical. Uh, and this basically, this leads to an inevitable uh, conflict between the Islamic Republic, the clerical republic, and the uh, new strata of the middle class. So even though the revolution was a middle class revolution, their young uh, were much more radicalized than the clerical hierarchy and the bazaar. And this, but the, the, I tried to give a basically a sociological explanation for the inevitable clash between the Mujahideen and the New Republic. And as I said, it was it was easy to do the research because there, there was so much material uh, during this period. Of course, the Mujahideen had their newspapers, their journals, uh, publications, and you could uh, find information stuff, inf sociological information. I wasn't interested in psychological or what made the individuals tick. You obviously could not get that from uh, the newspapers, but you, the newspapers did provide a solid information on sociological, educational, uh, age backgrounds of the Mujahideen. Well, great, that is true. Uh, one can see how intensively you use, you use those sources However, uh, you also interviewed uh, many key people, including Masoud Rajavi and some of the former Mujahideen before the split. They 
well-known Marxist group splitting from them. And you think in particular now that about 30 years, 35 years have passed, can you tell us something about your uh, interview with Rajavi or any or Banisad or, or some of the folks that you interviewed and how helpful did you find them? Because the book was published in, uh, if I'm not wrong, in 89. And the Mujahideen of AD, I'm assuming that you did research for s- several years prior to the publication of the book. The Mujahideen then uh, and Mujahideen now are a little different, particularly now that with what is happening in Albania. Anything you want to share with, with, with us about your experience of personally meeting with the leaderships or some other personalities? in um, researching the book. Yes, I mean, what I think is intriguing, this is a question I had to raise after I did most of the work, is uh, how a, a mass movement can, in fact, then turn into a small cult. Uh, and this was a transformation, which I wasn't originally interested in. I was interested in the mass movement. And that, that's still a sort of intriguing question. I think the answer is, of course, the situation uh, once the Islamic Republic already cracked down on the Mujahideen, they had no choice but to leave the country uh, of what survived. And outside uh, Iran, then Rajavi as the leader, and here, of course, he was a, he was a charismatic figure. Uh, and you could see that talking to him and interviewing him. He, he was a very strong, uh, attractive person. Uh, he had his uh, personal followings. And uh, my speculation is that uh, he figured in exile the only way to keep unity of the organization is to build uh, on the personality cult. Uh, because you often find organizations that are uh, uh, abroad, exiled, uh, tend to fragment. You get invariably splinter offs, and eventually the organization disintegrates. And I think uh, Rajavi came to the conclusion that the way to keep the organization was to basically build it around his personality. So it didn't matter what the policy was as long as the members of the organization followed him, they, he would uh, retain uh, the Mujahideen organization. Uh, so that was the only sort of answer I could give how, the organi- how it transformed itself from a mass movement to a cult, which I would now describe as very much as a, a sectarian cult. So what was he forthright and open in your interview with him, or how did you find him in the interview? This is important because Mujahideen basically waged a campaign against your, your book when your book was published. I have read some of the materials uh, they have published, and almost they published a book-like um, critique of, of your book about Mujahideen. Yes, I mean, I think they were confused because my original question, you know, why a mass movement should have appealed to them because they, I accepted the fact that they were a mass movement. What they really disliked was my the last basically section of the book where I tried to explain their transformation from a mass movement to a sectarian movement. Uh, that That's what actually annoyed them. And that's why they wrote an, a book, a booklet denouncing that everything I'd written was rubbish and so on. But I think if they'd read my book carefully enough, they would have noticed that. But I was actually, you could say the book is actually quite favorable to Mojahedin, uh when it's dealing with uh, as organization as a mass movement. Yeah, no, I, I, I do agree with you. My last question on this book is that there is a chapter on shariati in the book. I know that in many of your writings, you have talked about shariati, but I thought maybe this is a good moment for us to hear your thoughts about shariati. Yes, I mean, often this type of radical uh, Islam is uh, accredited to shariati. 
Uh, and I wanted to show that there was something else going on. At the same time, Shariati was developing his radical interpretation of Shi'ism, uh, the Mujahideen were doing a similar parallel separately. Um, so it's not like they were uh, adopting or plagiarizing from Shariati. They were actually on the same track, but separate track. And this actually then leads to the question, what was going on in society that you have this development of a new form of Islam uh, from coming from different ends, different social back, uh, different individuals? And uh, again, I think my answer goes back to this, the social background, both of Shariati and the Mujahideen, are, is very much from to traditional middle class exposed to radical ideas of the West and trying to merge sort of a variety of Marxism with, uh, with Shi Islam and interpreting Shi Islam in a very, I would say, secular radical way. So it it becomes, of course, a very strong influence in Iran and also indirectly influences Khomeini and his ideas at that time. Thank you so much. First of all, let me say that, like Professor Abrahamian's other works, this is very distinctive in, in methodology and approach compared to other writers. It's not about how they got it right or how people got it wrong and who was a good person, who was not a good person. But to look at this as a social phenomenon in continuation with what you had done already in your dissertation, uh, looking at history from below and interested in crowds in social movements and people, and then finding the case of uh, the organization which I did have, especially in its, in its formation and its formative phase as a, a mass movement, not only before the revolution, but especially after the revolution, right? With the Jomeshe Mendir Mujahideen, according to some statistics, 120,000 and to others, 300,000 uh, registries, uh, young people who showed up and registered for the movement. My question has to do with another segment of that crowd, of that traditional middle class, Bazari type, rural sometimes, sometimes uh, maybe laboring class in Tehran who join uh, such a mass movement in terms of coming up with a radical and radicalized, change-oriented, even secular understanding of Shiism. The alternative, the other side of the coin, who may have shared origins with the Mujahideen, would be the people who joined the Islamic Republic in persecuting and destroying the Mujahideen. They were also a big part of the machinery of the state. Would you agree? Very similar social background uh, that we find in the leftist branch of Mujahideen and Galab Islami, and also in the right branch as well. I mean, in terms of middle class, traditional, traditional middle class people. Would you agree that part of this transition from a mass movement into a sectarian cult had to do with the clash between two segments of the same? large mass movement. What you say is, I think, uh, correct. There is, uh, what I would add is also, a, a lot of the younger sort of educated uh, radicals who decided to join the Islamic Republic rather than continue with the Mujahideen, uh, they were, I think, faced by a personal choice. They, they had, many of them had either been in the Mujahideen or sympathized with the Mujahideen. You couldn't have distinguished them from Mujahideen before the revolution. But after the revolution, a lot of uh, Mujahideen members and sympathizers or fellow travelers had a choice. Uh, if you remain with the Mujahideen, you're likely to be basically killed at some point. If you join the Islamic Republic, the, it, it opens up career opportunities. Uh, so many of them then actually join the state, the bureaucracy. And if you look at the background of many of the present technocrats, they, would have, they wouldn't admit it now, but they, if you looked at their backgrounds, they before the revolution, they would have identified somehow as sympathizers of the Mujahideen. So here, actually, it's, I think, more... Uh, it's not a thing I could do because you need a lot of personal information, 
But I think the question of careerism and survival is then it becomes a key issue here. And of course, if you ask them, they would say, well, the Mujahideen became a terrorist organization. The, the Islamic Republic uh, was what the revolution produced, so we supported the Islamic Republic. Uh, but uh, again, their, their ideology would not have been very different from the Mujahideen before the fall of the Shah. And th th this also creates a strain, I think, within the Islamic Republic. People who come from clerical backgrounds, parents or uncles were clerics, they feel somewhat different from people who may come from bazaar backgrounds and uh, have been then uh, radicalized by Mujahideen Oregon. So there is this, uh, uh, I would say, secular is, uh, religion versus clerical is religion. I remember Masood Rajavi telling me uh, that when he went, he not he, but when Mujahideen delegation went to see Khomeini in Iraq, Khomeini didn't trust him because he said Khomeini could smell anti-clericalism among the Mujahideen. And I think this is a, it gets to the core of it. So however religious they were, uh, their ideas of, Mujah of Islam was a much, more not a clerical interpretation. And, and therefore there's actually interesting theological issues come in. For instance, Khomeini asked uh, the, the Mujahideen delegates the question, you know, in the resurrection, does the whole body is resurrected or not? Um, and their answer was, of course, this was a metaphor. They didn't believe in the actual physical resurrection. And for Khomeini, then, that was suspect because they really were not true Muslims because they didn't believe in what he considered fundamental to Islam, that on, on resurrection day, the body was, would be res resurrected fully. So I think these issues that were often hidden before the revolution became open afterwards. Later on, actually, when the Mojahedin became a cult, you get very little ideas from their works. Uh, so you really don't know what their thinking is. What, you can't say what's their ideology because there is no ideology. But at the time, uh, immediately after the revolution, they clearly had a very different version of Islam. <laughs> 